So this morning I'd like to speak to you about three main topics. The first is I want to emphasize to you the importance of plumbing in terms of public health protection, in terms of preventing waterborne disease. Plumbing is in many respects a key building block to protecting public health. Second, I'd like to speak a bit to the role of my organization, the World Health Organization, what we do in terms of internationally trying to reduce waterborne disease. And finally, I'd like to speak to the collaborative efforts of WHO and the World Plumbing Council. So globally, we see every year 1.8 million people dying from diarrhea disease. And 90% of these people who are dying are children under the age of five. In addition to that, when you have a diarrhea episode, you have reduced caloric intake and reduced nutrient intake. And as a result, you see delayed development of children, delayed growth of children. On top of that, we have millions of people who are exposed to high levels of arsenic and fluoride. And as a result, you have vulnerable populations who are suffering from crippling skeletal damage and cancer. So I want to give you some examples of why plumbing is important from a public health perspective. And I'll focus just on the developed country examples because we need to remember that as WHO, I'm here not only speaking to developing country issues, but developed country issues. Plumbing is an issue for developed and developing country, and I want to emphasize that. So according to a report published by CDC and the US EPA in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, from 1997 to 1998, we had three of their eight outbreaks in community water system caused by improper plumbing and cross connections at an individual facility, so at a restaurant and at an office building. Now if you look at the numbers from the United Kingdom at the very bottom, they took a huge data set, 1911 to 1995, and their numbers again are, are fascinating. 36% of their waterborne disease outbreaks were caused by problems in the distribution system. Now on top of health problems associated with plumbing, you also have major costs, big costs. If you look at the uh, I think it's called the Amoy Gardens in Hong Kong. They had the spread of SARS directly related to the plumbing issue, improper plumbing within the Amoy Gardens. And if you look at the total cost of SARS to Asian countries, it's $60 billion. So plumbing can have some pretty serious impacts financially. If you look at the transmission of foot and mouth disease from faulty plumbing drainage installation in Burbright, United Kingdom, the total cost associated with that outbreak was 100 million pounds. So we're not just talking health, we're talking dollars and cents. Now, the reason why we're so concerned as WHO is because right now the population at risk is huge. And again, this is an issue in developed and developing countries. And I'll just show you some data. So this data is collected by the World Health Organization together with UNICEF, our partners in the Joint Monitoring Program. And what you can see here is that 50%, so 3.3 billion people in the world today are serviced by piped water. So they have plumbing within their homes. This number is continuing to grow. If you look at piped sanitation facilities connected to sewer water, right now 31% of the world's population has access. And so as WHO and as a plumbing industry, we need to ensure that the millions of new installations that are going in as these trends continue are put in properly. The challenge that we're currently experiencing is that we have limited recognition of plumbing as a important and critical profession in terms of public health protection. So next I want to speak to the role of my organization. What do we do? Um, do we install plumbing? No, we don't. Um, <laughs> What we've been doing, I'll start at the very beginning, um, shortly after WHO was formed in 1953, we conducted a survey of 71 different countries. And what they told us is that they had no official standards for drinking water, no official standards for sampling and testing drinking water quality. So the first order of business was in 1958, produced the international standards for drinking water. And essentially, these are the criteria for sampling and laboratory methods. And this was our very first document. It's continued to evolve over time, and it's still very much the foundation of our work. It's the cornerstone of our work. And so that's referring to the second one from the bottom, which is norms and standards. That's our work today. We do norms and standards, and we have what is the third edition of the guidelines for drinking water quality. And in it, we recommend 
um, values for over 150 different parameters, chemical, physical, biological, um, and radiological. We've also evolved a bit more over time. We're now providing guidance on management. How do you properly manage um, a water supply system, a large water utility? And this is called our water safety plan approach, and essentially it's a risk management approach. And globally what we see is that countries are taking the guidelines for drinking water quality and these guideline values and they're incorporating them into their standards and their regulations. And we're also pleased to say that we're starting to see the water safety plan approach being directly reflected in regulations such as in um, Scotland and in New Zealand. Now in terms, oh I also wanted to point out, this is a really neat photo. This is from 1955 from the Philippines and this is a chlorinometer. So they've gotten a bit smaller over time. So in terms of the other work we do, policy and advocacy, well this year is 2008 and because of that we are supporting and participating in the International Year of Sanitation. In terms of research, um, one example of the work we do is we're exploring alternatives to incinerating medical waste, trying to reduce the release of dioxins and mercury. In terms of partnerships, well, we work together with 72 countries in the Global Alliance of Vaccines and Immunizations, and we do it from a healthcare waste perspective. In terms of capacity, we are supportive of and we're supporting workshops and training sessions on things like the water safety plan approach, so helping countries in better managing their water sanitation and hygiene activities. In terms of the tools that we do, uh, one product that we're currently working on is developing a guidance document for countries to use on how to do a cost-benefit analysis for um, interventions in water supply systems, looking at it from a community level to a national level. So in other words, converting things into dollars and cents, making it uh, politicians more aware of the importance of protecting water, protecting sanitation, and improving hygiene from a financial perspective to get those politicians to buy in. And another example of a kit we're working on with a number of organizations is to develop a low-site, low-cost, on-site test kit for E. coli. Oops. I should also add that something that's evolved over the past five or six years is we are now um, becoming more formal in, our, in terms of bringing people together with common interest to exchange knowledge and information. When I first started being exposed directly to WHO and their work, I was doing small water supply management and they had just initiated an international network for small community water supplies. And for me, it was knowing that, although I was running a national program, I felt like I was very much in a bubble, but suddenly I was exposed to all these different people from Iceland, from Bangladesh, who were dealing with the exact same challenges. And so it was a good way to begin to move forward on addressing my challenges within my particular country at that time. Um, these networks not only serve as fora, but they also feed into the, the expertise that we we need in order to develop these guidance documents, just like we're not experts in plumbing per se, but we liaise with those experts. So now where do we get our marching orders from as WHO? What is driving us forward at this point? Well, in September 2000, we had the largest ever gathering of heads of state, and they ushered in the new millennium which, with the Millennium Declaration. And essentially what it is, it's a declaration that was endorsed by a huge number of countries, 189 different countries, and it was translated into a roadmap that set out goals to be reached by 2015. So the eight Millennium Development Goals, which is what they're called, build on agreements reached at UN conventions in the 1990s. And they represent commitments of those 189 countries to reduce poverty and hunger, to tackle ill health, gender inequality, lack of education, lack of access to clean water, and environmental degradation. And in terms of where I work with water sanitation, hygiene, and health, the MDG that we follow is to have between 1990 and 2015 the proportion of the population without improved drinking water and sanitation. So those are marching orders, and that's what's been committed to by 189 different countries.